So today, we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Interesting book. And what we're going to see today is how to deal with persecution. And some of you here this morning say, hey, we don't have to learn that, John. We're in, we're in a Christian country. America. We live in America. We don't have to worry about persecution in America. You know, it's, it's a Christian country. Is it? I, I, I give, I, I'll give heed to the fact that it started as a Christian country. We had Puritans coming over here to New England in the 1600s, and their goal was religious freedom. Their goal was to be a city set on a hill. And, and yes, I believe we started this country with, with uh, Christianity as a foundation for this country. I believe that, that we had a strong blessing on this country because of the Christian foundation that was the, set when this country was started. But we've come a long way, baby, in a negative way. I don't know about you, but I see it getting darker in our country. I see all the value system of our country going away from Christianity. I see a political correctness that is not biblically correct. And I see, along with that, Jesus said in Matthew 24, that in the in last days, lawlessness will increase. People's love will grow cold, and it's going to get worse. And I tell you what, we need to know as Christians here in the United States how to deal with persecution, because it's coming. And it's already here. It's more of a subtle form today. Today, if you're a Christian, you take Christian stances, and stances for righteousness, even in our culture here in the United States, you're going to get some heat. You're going to get some heat in regards to uh, values against your values as a Christian. How do I know that? Because 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul promised that. He said, all who live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? Persecuted. If you're living a godly life in an ungodly world and you're taking stances for Christ, you're going to get some persecution. And if you're not facing any heat for your Christianity, it might be because you're not taking stances for righteousness. And Jesus said, we're to maintain our salt. We're to be the salt of the earth. And if our saltiness goes away, what good are we? We're to be different. We're to be people that are shining our light out into the darkness. And because of that, that darkness sometimes is going to be opposing us, and we're going to get some heat. Now, granted, in this country, we're not facing what the Sudan's facing. In, in, in the Sudan and some areas, if you're a Christian, you'll get killed. We're not facing what China's facing with the underground church, where if, you, if you're found out as a born-again Bible-believing Christian, Christian, even in China, you could go to ch- uh, jail or you could have your family split up. We're not facing what many of the Muslim countries are in, in the 1040 window in the Mideast. If you take a stance for Christ and you witness in those Mideast, Mideastern countries and proselytize is what they call it, you could be thrown in prison for being a witness for Christ. We don't have that in America. But there is some other persecution going on here in our country. It's subtle. It's alienation. It's ridicule. It's people pushing you away because of your stance for Jesus Christ. And in the midst of that, Paul told us in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to all who believe. Don't be ashamed of the thing that saved you. And we got to keep strong even when there's pressure to give in and give way and give up on our values, on our righteousness, and the stances we take for Christ. So today I'm going to give you some handles of truth that will help us in this area. Help us to stand strong and be those witnesses that take stances of righteousness in an unrighteous world. I'm going to help you with that this morning. Before we do that, though, let me give you some background on Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, if you remember, was written after Paul was in Acts chapter 17. He had his second missionary journey going on. And in that second missionary journey, remember what he did? He preached the gospel in Thessalonica for three Sabbath days, probably only four weeks. And then because of persecution of religious leaders, he got driven out of Thessalonica and he had to leave. And then about a year later, he found himself in the city of Corinth. He was concerned about those Thessalonians. So he sent Timothy from Corinth back to Thessalonica to check on the church there. And if you remember, we talked about this in the last First Thessalonians. We talked about it in the last book. We, We discovered that Paul discovered after Timothy came back, a great report was given, Paul, about the church in Thessalonica. The church was on fire the church was so on fire that all over Greece, Macedonia and uh, Achaia, which is present-day Greece, people were talking about the, the Christians in Thessalonica, that they had turned from idols to serve the living and the true God. And their church was doing great. They were sounding forth their stance for Christ. So Paul wrote First Thessalonians to him. Further exhortation, further teaching about the rapture. Remember, he to- told him First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 18, that you're going to be caught up in the clouds to be with the Lord in the air. And there's going to be this sudden worldwide event of the rapture. 
And the trumpet's going to blow. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And so he taught him further about the end times. And then he also told him in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, he said this, and you aren't appointed for wrath, but salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then in chapter 5, he talked to him about this coming day of the Lord that's going to be a great tribulation. Now, in the meantime, some of the Thessalonians were exposed to false teaching. And they bought into it. And the false teaching was this, because of the persecution you're now facing because of your Christianity, you're in that great tribulation. The day of the Lord has come. And they, they, they negated what Paul had taught them, that you're going to be raptured out of here, then the day of the Lord is going to come. And so what some of the believers there at Thessalonians, the uh, Thessalonica, what they were doing was they were just watching and waiting and quitting their jobs and leeching off the church and saying, hey, just feed us. We're just going to wait. We're in the great tribulation. So Christ is coming any moment now. So we'll quit our jobs and charge up all our credit cards. No, they didn't have credit cards. But they, they basically quit their jobs and just stood around waiting. So Paul writes this second letter to address some of these things. This week, he's going to talk about the persecution that they're facing. Next week, chapter 2, he's going to lay it out. The day of the Lord, the great tribulation, is not going to be in place until the Antichrist comes. And he's going to give us the most specific scripture, I believe, in the Bible, describing what the Antichrist is going to be like and what he's going to do. And that's going to be the sign of the great tribulation, the Antichrist. Don't miss next week. Fascinating scripture about the Antichrist next week. And then in chapter 3, we're going to see in a couple of weeks, Paul's going to lay it out to these believers that were just waiting and quitting their jobs and getting other people to feed them and stuff. And he's going to say these words to him. He's going to say this. He's going to say, hey, listen, those that aren't working, get back to work. And if you won't work, don't, don't let them eat. Don't keep feeding these people that aren't working anymore. And so we'll see that in chapter 3, some practical exhortations there. So with that background in mind, Let's get, get in our scripture, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to talk about persecution, how to deal with it from the pen of the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Chapter 1, uh, 2 Thessalonians, if you're there, say amen. Well, here we go. All right, Paul and Salvanus, here's the greeting, and Timothy. Now, Salvanus is the Roman way of saying Silas. So this is his missionary team, Paul and Silas and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God our Father, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Typical Pauline greeting here now. Grace to you and what? Peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the first thing I want you to see, how does he address the church? It's the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What makes a Christian a Christian? It's not head knowledge. Book of James says you could believe in your head just like the demons, and the demons believe in their head and they tremble. A lot of Christians think their head knowledge about Jesus Christ or even the Word of God is saving them. No, it's not. What saves you is you're in God the Father and you're in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? You have a personal abiding relationship with Jesus Christ where he's in you and you're in him. Jesus said, I'm the vine. You are the branches. If any, any man abides in me, I'll abide in him and he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, what did he say? You do nothing. The Bible says if any man is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man, notice, is in Christ, he's a new cre creature or creation, another version says, the old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. What makes you a Christian? It's you're in Christ. Christ is in you. And you have this abiding relationship that's changed your life. You're not the same anymore. You have a new life in Christ because you're in him and he's in you and you have this ongoing, personal, abiding relationship with him. It's not about up here. It's about here. And I've heard some people say that people are going to miss heaven by 14 inches between their head and their heart. And the only way you can know that you're saved is if you're in Christ because the Bible says, John 1, 12, but as many as received him, he gives the right to become children of God even to those who believe in his name. You've got to be in Christ. You've got to have a real relationship with them. If you're here this morning and you haven't done that yet, do it today. It's the best decision you'll ever make to make a decision to be in Christ and let him be in your heart because you received him as Savior and Lord. But notice also, as you're in Christ, Paul then wishes them this, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Typical Pauline greeting again, but notice, he wishes them grace which is God's undeserved merit and favor, charis in the Greek, and he wishes them peace. Peace is serenity of soul. Peace is the ability to have 
uh, restfulness in your soul instead of chaos in your soul. And notice the order. You ever see Paul saying, peace to you and grace? Never. He always says, grace to you and peace. Why? Because you can't have God's peace in your heart until you're covered by his grace. And you're never going to have peace in your heart until you experience Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Notice something else in that grace to you and peace. Where, what's the source of grace and peace? Where do you get it from? God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see the uh, pointing to the deity of Christ there? Only God the Father and only the Lord Jesus Christ can give us grace and peace. And it doesn't fit to put someone else's name in there. Put my name in there. It doesn't fit. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and Pastor John. doesn't fit because I'm not the source of grace and peace. The Father is and the Son is. And that points to the deity of Christ also because Jesus Christ is the one that could give us undeserved merit and favor and peace in our soul. And no man can give that to you, but God can Points to the deity of Christ right there, that Jesus Christ, along with the Father, is the source of grace and the source of peace. Now let's go on. First point on how to deal with persecution. Go to verse 3. It says, we also always give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows even greater. Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith. In the midst of, here it is, all your what? Persecutions and afflictions which you endure. And this is plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you'll be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which indeed you are what? Suffering. Interesting scripture. But look at the benefits and the blessings that are in the Thessalonians' life because they're persevering through persecution. Paul says, hey, your faith it's greatly enlarged because you're persevering through persecution. Not only that, your love for one another, look what it says there. It says your love for one another grows even greater. And not only that, you're considered worthy of the kingdom of God because of the persecution you're facing with pers perseverance and with faith. Interesting stuff. So what do we see here? Here's the first point for how to, how to deal with persecution. Persevere through it, but realize that as you persevere through persecution, you're going to grow. You're going to be blessed. Your faith is going to be enlarged. Not only is your faith going to be enlarged, you're going to have a love for one another that's not there before the persecution because you're going to have to cling to some other Christians in fellowship. You're going to have to do as it says in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more. It's the day draws near. And one of the benefits of persecution is going to drive you not only closer to God, it's going to drive you closer to other Christians, and your love for one another is going to grow because you're going to need each other. And not only that, you're going to be, have this sense, man, I'm considered worthy of the kingdom of God because of what I'm enduring for Jesus Christ. Paul put it this way, I want to know Christ, and I want to know the power of his resurrection, and I want to share in the fellowship of his sufferings. See what Paul's saying there? I want to know Christ to the point that not only do I know his power, but I know his suffering because it helps me identify with my Savior and it helps me grow spiritually. It's one of the benefits. And we got to see that because it gets the, as we face uh, opposition, as we face affliction, as we face people giving us a hard time about our Christianity, we need to realize that's going to drive us closer to one another. It's going to enlarge our faith and we're going to have this sense we're worthy of the kingdom of God because we're making these stances for Jesus Christ. Tell you what, it'll help you grow spiritually. It really will. Think about the church, just in the New Testament. Church in the New Testament, from the very beginning, faced persecution to the point that they got driven out of their own city, Jerusalem, and then they were scattered abroad to all these other nations. And as they faced that persecution, the church blossomed and got on fire. There's a saying in church history the blood of the martyrs is always the seed of the church. And if you want to have an on-fire church, man, persecution will purify, persecution will help faith to grow and churches to be strong. One of the reasons why we're struggling in the church in the United States today is because it's too easy to be a Christian in the United States sometimes. Go to some other countries and you'll see some on-fire Christians in churches because of the persecution they're facing and they're having to take a stance for Christ. 
Interesting, the New Testament church also not only faced persecution from religious leaders and the Jewish, Jewish religious leaders that were against them, they faced persecution from the Roman Empire. Did you know that? Roman Empire went after Christianity because uh, Nero lit his own city on fire, the city of Rome, and then after he lit it on fire, he got in trouble because it started getting out that he lit his own city on fire. So you know what Nero did? He blamed the Roman fire on Christians. And after that, within 100 year, years, millions of Christians were persecuted and killed. But you know what? The church didn't die. The church grew like fire throughout the Roman Empire because the persecution purified their faith, enlarged their love for one another, and made them stronger in Christ. Interesting. Um, when I was in college, I went from this high school where we had about 100 on fire Christians. Young Life was strong in our high school. Had this great fellowship. Then I got thrown into this college, 45,000 students, University of Illinois, with the largest fraternity and sorority system in the, in the country. And I got lost in the sea of humanity of 45,000 students. And I remember, I remember getting involved, at, uh, going to class, you'd just have thousands of students. We were like cows being, you know, run down an aisle or something. And there's just people everywhere. And I remember that I was going, man, I, I got to get some fellowship here. I got to get some uh, 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 help with this uh, sea of humanity I'm dealing with right here. And so what I did was um, uh, we started a Bible study in the uh, dormitory I was in. And I'll never forget because the dormitory was Illini Towers, and there's 70% of the people that were in that dormitory, 11-story dormitory, were kids from the north side of Chicago that were Jewish. And here we are starting this Bible study. And Israel, the nickname for the, uh, the dormitory was Israeli Towers. <laughs> And I tell you what, we started this Bible study, and uh, I, t I put, I remember I put flyers up on every floor by the elevators, and then we decided we were going to start this Bible study because there were so many Jewish kids in that dormitory. We started the Bible study on the book of Hebrews because I thought that would be applicable. We get some of these Jewish people coming to uh, Bible study. It was like throwing a match on gasoline. I mean, the, the persecution just lit, because they, were, they, they saw us as, you know, pushing our Christianity on them or whatever. All we were doing was starting a Bible study. And I remember my roommate at the time, his name was Jay Goldstein. He's a corporate lawyer in Chicago right now, uh, strong uh, Jewish background. And I remember coming home, back to my dormitory after our Sunday night Bible study in the book of Hebrews, and he'd be clapping as he heard me coming down the, the hallway. He'd be saying, hey, Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters now, let's sing. Amen. And he, what does he do? He was, he was just giving me grief. And I remember Jay, the whole time, we, the whole year I lived with him, he was just like this and this and this and this. And, and then I'd say things, Jay, I'm going to be praying for you. Like this. But the, the persecution kicked in because we were taking a stance for Christ. But you know what? That year that we, we led that Bible study in the dormitory, we saw people come to Christ. We saw lives changed. And I grew like a weed because I had the opportunity to take a stance for Christ I'm, 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 with all kinds of opposition in that 11-story dormitory. Praise the Lord. Let's take stances for Christ. And as we do that, as we take stances for righteousness and be a witness in a lost world, here's what's going to happen. Our faith's going to enlarge, our love for one another is going to grow, and we're going to have this sense that we're worthy of the kingdom of God. Do you see that? So first principle for persecution is realize it'll help you grow spiritually. Now let's go on. Verse 6. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, to give relief to you who are afflicted. And to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire. Now question, when is the Lord Jesus going to be revealed with flaming fire? Revelation 19 talks about it. It's the second coming. It's after this great tribulation, Christ is coming back on a white horse, it actually says, with the armies of heaven, and he's going to establish his rule upon the earth for a thousand years. And what's interesting is he's going to come not as a suffering servant like he did the first time. He's going to come as a conquering king, with flaming fire. And it says the sword of his mouth is going to destroy the Antichrist and his 200 million troops to the point that blood as high as the bridles of horses is going to flow in the valley of Megiddo for 200 square miles. That's the judgment of God that's coming. And that's being referred to here in this verse. And then in verse 8 it says, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God 
and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Interesting, away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. So what is going to characterize God's judgment and what ultimately is going to characterize hell? You know what characterizes hell? The absence of God. Away from his presence. Away from his glory. That's why uh, the Bible describes hell as outer darkness. That's what hell is. And it goes on and says, and these will pay the, the penalty of eternal destruction. What characterizes hell also is it's for eternity. Eternal destruction. Away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed. So here's a second point about persecution. Realize, those that are afflicting you, if they stay in a point of being disobedient to God and rejecting Christ, they will face judgment. Why is that important? So you don't have to worry about judgment. When people are persecuting you, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. It's coming. And we're not to retaliate with those that are giving us a hard time about our Christianity. Jesus said, turn what? the other cheek. Jesus said, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Right? And that's important because if we're going to be the witnesses we're called to be, we don't need to be attacking back. We need to realize those that are rejecting Christ, we need to lead to Christ because if, they, if we don't, there's eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of God for the rest of eternity. That's what the Bible says. And really, there's going to be two judgments. The first judgment's going to be ultimately when Jesus comes back and establishes his kingdom here on earth, he's going to judge all those that are against him, the Antichrist and all the troops. But there's a second judgment after Jesus reigns for a thousand years. It's called the great white throne of judgment, Revelation chapter 20. And, and what's going to happen at the end of time, what's going to happen is Christ is going to raise up all the dead that have died and rejected him, and they're going to be brought before the great white throne of judgment, Revelation 20, 11 to 15 says, and they're going to be judged according to their deeds. And interesting, it says in Revelation 20, the books are going to be opened. And anything they've ever done wrong are going to be judged by a holy God, and they're going to be thrown in a lake of fire. Hell is real. And that's why our mission to reach people for Jesus Christ is so important. Because those that disobey God, those that reject God, ultimately judgment is coming for them. Hmm. You know, sometimes I think we mamby-pamby that. Sometimes we, we, we don't give people the truth and the whole truth, so help us God, because we don't realize the eternal destiny of those that reject Christ. And it's coming. Judgment's coming. And in the meantime, we need to take stances for Christ. But not only do we need to take stances for Christ, we don't need to attack people that are attacking us. The Bible says we're supposed to bless those that curse us. The Bible says, if possible, as far as it depends on us, we're to be at peace with all men. The Bible says that we're to return blessings for cursings. Um, it's hard. I'm, I'm right there with you, too. I'm, I have a competitive nature. And if someone attacks me, I want to, man, I want to attack them back. And I've learned through the years, especially if it's an attack on one of my stances or whatever else, the, if I attack back, I'm, I'm lowering the bar instead of keeping the bar high. Bless those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. And Jesus set the example, didn't he? What was he doing on the cross when people were spitting on his own creations, the ones he created were spitting on him and mocking him and putting a crown of thorns on his head and piercing his hands and his feet and just insulting their own creator. Jesus looked out on them and said, Father, forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. He prayed for those that were killing him. And he's calling us now to do the same. Matthew talks about this also. It says, Matthew 5, 43 to 45, it said, You've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, Love your enemies, here it is again, and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. One of the greatest examples to me is one of my heroes. Right after I became a Christian, I heard her on a TV, Christian TV show, 
give her testimony. Her name's Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth Elliot is just a hero. She's in heaven now, but she's just a hero to me because she was someone that went to the same college as Billy Graham. She went to Wheaton College in the 50s. And right around the same time that Billy Graham was there, <clears throat> or a little bit before that maybe, and Billy Graham was there in the 40s. She was there in the 50s. And she married a guy named Jim Elliot. And Jim Elliot um, had a burden for South America, and especially for this one tribe in the very heart of South America that were barbaric. They were killing other tribes' people, and they were just known for just being savage and barbaric. So Jim Elliot, along with some of his buddies from Wayne College, with their wives, they all moved to South America right by where this tribe's at. They started reaching out to this tribe for Christ. They started flying. The one guy was a, a private plane pilot. They started flying their, their planes over these Indians that were there and dropping gifts for them. And then they dropped Bibles for them. And then they dropped tracts for them. And then finally, some of these men, these missionaries, men, including Elizabeth Elliot's husband, Jim, felt led to land the plane one day and try to reach them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as they did this, these tribes people thought that they were from outer space or something. They'd never seen airplanes before, these guys. And they killed Jim Elliot and all the other men that these wives were married to. And then they put their bodies and shipped them down the river back to their wives. You know what Elizabeth Elliot did? Did she hate them? Did she have anger to them? I'm sure she dealing with mourning and loss and everything else. But the Lord laid on her heart to love this tribe and to keep being a witness to them. And they brought other missionaries in along with these ladies that continued to witness. And she stayed there for two years. Amazing. Some pictures here. That's her with her kids going and leading Bible studies after, after uh, this whole uh, massacre happened. That's her husband, Jim Elliot, that was martyred for his faith down there. And then, this is interesting. This is one of the leaders of that tribe that came to Christ because they loved them even though they killed their husbands. And he's traveled all around the world giving his testimony about how Elizabeth Elliot and his other wives loved them for their hate and for their persecution. They continued to stay there and be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that an example to us or what, church? Pray for those who persecute you and love your enemies, and they'll be a strong part of our witness. Now let's close up our chapter, verse 11. To this end, we also pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness in the work of faith with power so that the name of our Lord Jesus will be glorified in you and in you and him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the last principle. We need to see this. Paul prayed specific prayers for these Christians that were being persecuted in Thessalonica. Look at the specific prayers he prayed. He prayed, we pray for you always that you'd, you'd, you'd be worthy of your calling, that your goodness and the work of faith with power would be happening to you, that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus would be glorified in you, and that the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ would be there for you. He prayed specific prayers for these Christians that were being persecuted. And here's the last principle. You want to be strong in the midst of if you're facing attack, if you're facing battles because of your Christianity, have other believers praying for your church. The Bible says the prayers of righteous people are powerful. They're effective. They avail with much. We got a saying around here, prayer changes things. And when you find yourself in a battle, especially a spiritual battle, make sure other people are praying for you because it'll make a difference. Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers the church has ever had, it was in the 1800s, he pastored a, a huge church in London. It was the first real mega church in the 1800s. They had over 5,000 people on Sundays you know, coming to his church. And uh, it was called the London Metropolitan Tabernacle Church in London, England. And, and he, he was just an incredible preacher, gr great things going on in the church there. And so some seminarians came over um, from America, I think from New York, to visit him. And they wanted to learn about what was going on in the church. Why was this church so powerful? And so they thought it was his preaching. They thought it was maybe the administration and everything. So they met with Charles Spurgeon before the church service, before the 5,000 people all came at one time. They met with him personally. And then Charles Spurgeon, before they brought these seminarians to the sanctuary, he said, you guys, you want to see the engine behind this church? You want to see the power behind this church? He said, yeah, we'd love to see it. What is it? He brought them down to the furnace room in the basement. And before the service even started, there was 100 people down there. And they were praying for Charles Spurgeon. They were praying for the preaching for that day. And Charles Spurgeon said, this is the power 
that's behind the search. And this is the, the power that makes this engine run. And Charles Spurgeon had an incredible ministry because he had people praying for him. And guys, ladies, you need that too. Whether you're a preacher or not, you're in a spiritual battle. The Bible says we struggle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. We are in a spiritual battle, and we need other people in our lives that are praying for us so that we'll win the battles that we face. Because prayer changes things. Prayer is powerful and effective. And so when you're facing persecution, when you're facing battles, when you're facing things you need help with, uh, solicit other Christians to help you by praying specific prayers for you. I was thinking about that this week, and I was thinking about the fact that in the last 10 years, some of my favorite preachers, guys I've learned from, guys I respect, guys that I love, guys that have helped me in ministry, and I've, I've, I've sat at their feet and learned from their anointed, powerful teaching, three of my favorite preachers in the last five, 10 years, totally off the rails. They're not in ministry anymore. One of them, who I know personally, you know, pastor of the largest Calvary Chapel in the world, I don't even know if he's walking with the Lord right now. I talked to his brother at the last conference, the Stone Mountain Conference. His brother's a pastor. I said, how's he doing? And he said, well, he needs to repent. because His brother, his own brother said, I don't know if he's walking with the Lord right now. Go, that breaks my heart. But I was thinking about that this week. And I think a part of why these guys, they had such powerful ministries, these guys I looked to and I listened to, they had such powerful ministries, they were in the midst of spiritual battles because there was demons after them trying to shut them down and try to attack them. And you know one of the reasons why all three of these guys that I'm speaking of fell? I think one of the reasons why is they didn't have enough guys, people in their churches and other people praying for them. And for the battles that they were facing, they should have been going out there and soliciting more people in the church and in the ministry and within Calvary Chapel, if necessary, to pray for them. Because prayer changes things. Prayer can get us victory. Prayer can help us in the persecution and the afflictions and the warfare that every single Christian faces. And if you're not facing spiritual warfare, man, it might be because you don't have a spiritual pulse. Because if you're alive spiritually, there's warfare out there. There's a real demon, uh, de a devil, and there's real demons that are active against anybody that's doing for, stuff for God. And we're going to face some heat for our Christianity. And we need people praying for us. Amen? Amen? We're to pray for one another, especially when there's battles going on. So what did we learn this morning about facing persecution? Number one, it's going to produce what in our lives? Spiritual growth. Our faith is going to be enlarged. We're going to learn to love each other more because of the stuff that we face. So there's a positive aspect to the persecution. The blood of the, the martyrs is always the seed of the church. And good thing, we're considered worthy of the kingdom if we're taking stances to the point that we're willing to face some heat for those stances we're taking. Number two, the second thing we learned this morning, very important, is don't retaliate. People are attacking you giving you a hard time for your Christianity, realize sometimes the people that are closest to the kingdom are the people that are lashing back because God's working on them. And instead of lashing back at them and attacking back on them, love them. Turn that enemy into a friend. And not only that, pray for them because that's what Jesus did for his enemies. Don't retaliate. Pray and love and turn those enemies into friends and lead them to Christ. The last thing we learned this morning, very important, Facing battles, there's warfare going on. Don't be afraid to ask other strong Christians to pray for you because you need it and I need it too. In church, I ask you, pray for me. Pray for Pastor John. Pray for Heidi as, we lead, help, as Heidi helps lead the women's ministry too. Pray for the leaders of this church because the warfare is real. And you know what? As we take stances for Christ, I know that's true for you also. The warfare is real. So let's pray for one another. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your, your word this morning. Thank you that your word equips us for righteousness, Lord. Thank you so much that your word is true. We shall know the truth, and the truth will set us free. And Father, I pray right now for Christians in this room that are amidst of maybe some alienation, maybe some persecution, maybe getting some hard times, maybe from extended family because of the stances they're taking for Christ. Help them not to give up or give in. Help them to keep being steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Help them to keep taking stances of righteousness in an unrighteous world, Lord. And help us to be people, Lord, that as we've learned this morning, realize there's benefits to the warfare. 
that our faith is going to be enlarged, our love for one another is going to grow deeper, and we're going to uh, be considered worthy of the calling that you call us with as we stand for Christ in a world that needs to see that. Lord, help us to be a people, too, as we've learned this morning, that uh, don't retaliate, but rather we love. And we give love back for insult. We give blessing back for cursing, Lord. And we pray for those even that are giving us a hard time because they're close. They're close to the kingdom of God. And Lord, I pray, too, that we would be people that are praying for one another. Help us to be lifting each other up in prayer especially for those that are struggling with issues or warfare or things going on. Help us to be lifting those people's arms up in our own arms up with prayer, Lord. Thank you for the power of prayer, Lord. And I pray for anybody that's here this morning that's in the midst of a battle. I pray, Lord, that you would be with them, that they would see, as we sang this morning, your goodness, Lord, in the midst of the battle. I pray that you give them victory over those things they need victory in, Lord. I pray that you give them power, where there's been weakness, I pray for power, Lord. Pray for strength. I pray for a faith that believes we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Lord, empower us this morning to be those warriors, those soldiers for Christ you've called us to be. And I pray these things now in Jesus' name.